We have here a 2002 Volkswagen Jetta diesel TDI and the customer's complaint is that when uh, they're driving it for a while it goes into limp mode, starts lacking power, they can cycle the key off, cycle the key back on, they gain their power again for a certain period of time and then it does it again. Uh, we'll check some trouble codes, test drive the vehicle, take some graphs, make some checks, see if we can find this problem. The screen flickers on this laptop. My old laptop, the screen didn't flicker so much. Um, I guess it's just a difference in the screen. And the codes here we have. Engine start by blocked by immobilizer. We're going to ignore that. Boost pressure regulation. I'm sure that's the cause of our limp mode. Limit exceeded over boost condition. And engine coolant temp sensor signal too high um, the engine coolant temp sensor trouble code won't cause limp mode we're just going to address the boost problem on this one I might uh, slap a sensor in it that's super cheap and fix it but that almost always goes away if you just clear it let's take a road test and see if we can duplicate the overboost condition in the limp mode in order to graph boost with VAGCOM you scan the engine computer You go to measuring blocks group 11 and that shows you boost specified and boost actual and then down at the lower right you click graph and that gives you the graph I'll just move it over into the screen here and these four fields translate into these four fields right here and it'll show you boost on a graph as we drive the car. I'm not going to try and video while I'm driving the car. I'll just show you the graph that I record in a screen capture after I drive it. I've taken a quick screen capture and green is specified boost. That's how much boost the computer's expecting to see. And yellow is actual boost. And you can see yellow comes up here and goes off the chart. And when I back out of the throttle, it comes back into the chart. This should be an easy problem to identify because uh, it's just so clearly overboosting uh, all the time. Every time I've accelerated, it's overboosted off the chart like this. So we'll go back to the shop and make some checks and see why it's overboosting. I thought some of you might be interested in how to save this graph as a file so you could uh, save it for future reference or post it to a forum or something like that. And how you do that is most computers have a key that says print screen right there. You simply push print screen and that copies the whole screen to the clipboard. If you don't know what a clipboard is, you can Google that. And then you open up the paint program. Paint is a Windows program that allows you to ma manipulate uh, uh, picture files. And every Windows computer should have that. And then after you open uh, the paint program, you use the paste function right here, and, or you can hit Control V. There's a that, that's a keyboard shortcut for the paste function. But after you and you hit paste, right there, and it pastes that graph into the paint program, and you can scroll down to see the whole thing. You can also modify it by clipping the size down to just that screen, so the rest of the screen isn't on here and stuff. And then at that point, you simply save it as a file, just like you would any other. And I would name this Overboost. And I usually save as JPG files. And this is going to, I'm going to put this on my desktop so I can find it. And that's how you save a graph as a file so that you can view it later. Okay, for our overboost condition, we have to understand the way the turbo is controlled. It's controlled with this vacuum solenoid, uh, which is Volkswagen labels as the N75. 
I would call it a boost control solenoid and it of course has source vacuum run into it here and then this this uh, sends vacuum down to the turbo actuator itself which is down on the turbo uh, this is a vent it has to be free and clear it it comes over to a hose and usually shares that vent with the EGR solenoid over here also and eventually goes over here to the breather where it uh, is vented uh, inside the breather uh, so we we have a function inside VAGCOM called output test that turns this solenoid on and off and allows you to see that solenoid working if you hook a vacuum gauge to it. Uh, if you don't have a vacuum gauge, you can use a mighty vac, which is what I usually do, or you can actually just watch and see the uh, as you activate that function in VAGCOM, you can just watch and see the actuator move down uh, on the turbo. We're going to hook up our mighty vac to it and run the output test. If you want to remove a vacuum hose from a plastic part without breaking it, I suggest a technique like this. Get you a pointy scribe and dig around the outside. Give it a little spray with some penetrant oil. And then work that penetrant oil all the way around it. And it comes right off. Then we hook our Mighty Vac hose right here to the output of the N75. And then we run our output test. Okay, to do the output tests on this model of car, the engine has to be running. And it would be pointless to do this test without the engine running because we have a vacuum pump that's driven by the camshaft. So you wouldn't be getting much results if you uh, were checking vacuum when the engine was not running. So we go to output test down here. And this will take you through a series of tests. I'm going to uh, just skip right through them real quick. I might do a video later on what each of the tests do. But at this point, I'm just going to skip right through them and go right to our N75 test, test sequence. The, the test prior to the N75 test turns the engine off. But the N75 test is still, still works because it's operating off the vacuum from the uh, vacuum reservoir. So I'll just scroll through these real quick. And that shuts the engine off and the next check is the boost solenoid. And as you can see it starts high then goes low. And each time it does that the vacuum goes down just a little bit because the N75 is operating off the vacuum from that vacuum reservoir. So it keeps cycling it on and off. That right there is a good working N75 solenoid with a good vacuum supply so we don't need to do any further checks on the N75. Our next check will be on the actuator itself. So this time we hook our vacuum gauge up to the hose going down to the turbo actuator. And then we always want to pump this up to make sure the actuator and the hose is sealing vacuum. And that is sealing vacuum just fine. See the gauge needle stays steady. And then you want to look down at the turbo actuator rod and pump up the vacuum on the vacuum pump to see that the rod is moving and that the, the turbo vanes are not stuck. The, you can do that perfectly accurately with a mirror looking down in this hole right here and a flashlight, but I'm not going to be able to video that. I'm probably going to take a quick look with a mirror and then put the car on the rack so I can video it and show you. Okay, I have a turbo sitting over on the shelf and I'm going to hook my vacuum pump to it in order to demonstrate how far it should move. I thought it might be helpful to have a tape measure there to see how far the range of travel is. And uh, you can see the edge of the rod coming out of the turbo actuator is sitting right on the 2 inch mark. And we'll move it to full travel. And basically it's now at, at 3 eighths. So I'd say the travel is 3 eighths of an inch there at the turbo rod. Okay, we're now underneath the car and we're going to put our vacuum pump on the turbo actuator. Okay, I'm going to pump this up and watch the rod move. And basically it didn't move hardly at all. You can see there is a little bit of movement. The actuator does try and pull it, 
but the lever is stuck. That means the veins inside the turbo are stuck. Just All that movement is because of my hands pumping it, so sorry about that. But it is pumping it up. You can see a little bit of movement when I release it. And you can hear it kind of clunk, but the lever isn't moving at all. The rod coming out of the turbo actuator is trying to pull it, but it's just not moving at all because the veins inside the turbo are stuck. Now, on this one, they are stuck in the high boost position, and that means it's going to over boost. On other ones, they might stick in the low boost position, and you'd have an under boost problem. Uh, it kind of just depends on where the lever is stuck at in its range of motion. Now this one is very clear cut because it's just plain stuck solid, but these can stick intermittently. So if you're having an intermittent problem and you test it and it's good, you might not be uh, diagnosing it correctly because it can move sometimes and stick other times on the road. So uh, we're going to take this apart and do a vein cleaning and I'm not going to show the turbo being removed from the car. That's too big of a project and it's all in tight spots and everything hard to film. But I will show you disassembly of the turbo and cleaning of the veins and we'll take up filming after we get the turbo off. I have this turbo out and while I have it out I want to demonstrate how stuck it is because it wasn't very easy to see in the car. I'm pumping it up and you do you see the actuator tries to move the rod just a little bit but it's not really moving. And as I zoom in here, you can see the lever is already up against the stop. This lever right here is already up against that adjustable stop there. So it's stuck at the max boost position. Now as you disassemble this turbo, you have to be very careful of these bolts breaking. Uh, we heat these every time. We heat that right there, and then we put a, I prefer a six point wrench put a six point wrench on it and you just want to move it back and forth just a little bit. You don't want to just force it to turn. Wiggle it back and forth to get it to free up then move it a little bit at a time. Keep it really hot here if you have to reheat it again and uh, because when these break off you're going to spend an hour to two hours getting it out. Whereas if you heat it you might spend five or ten minutes getting each one out but you're not going to spend two or three hours on each one uh, trying to drill out a broken bolt there and re-tapping it and then have to Oh, it's, it's just a mess when bolts break. You know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure when it comes to broken bolts. So uh, I'm going to, I'm not going to film uh, heating and disassembling this, but I might show you the technique for we use for removing the cartridge from the exhaust manifold. Record. Okay, I wanted to show the technique for removing the cartridge from the exhaust manifold part of the turbo. Uh, being that it's in exhaust, this uh, tends to be pretty seized up in there sometimes. Sometimes it is necessary to heat around the outside to get it to free up. Uh, but usually if we use a, the technique that I've developed, they'll come out. And what we do is we use two blunt chisels. Um, they have to be blunt, sharp, would we damage the turbo. And we do equal and opposite pounding, which means we put it right here and right here. So what we do is we put it right here and right here and we make sure that you're on the cast iron of the cartridge and not the aluminum of this housing here. Okay, now as you do this, you need a helper obviously. I have uh, Mariah here helping and you need equal and opposite, meaning we need to time our strikes to where they're hitting at the same time and the force of my chisel isn't cocking it to the side and the force of his chisel isn't cocking it to the side. The force of both chisels at the same time draw it up equal. Are you ready? Whoa! Ta da! And as you can see, there's a whole bunch of carbon buildup in here, and this ring is seized up tight. This piece here does come out, so uh, you got to be careful not to lose it. As you can see here, our lever is free to move, but the ring 
that the end of this lever here sits inside this groove here and the ring is not free to move therefore our veins are stuck completely uh, also our pins came out with the cartridge this pin and this pin came out they go in here and in here whereas this pin stayed in place so these are free to move about and fall out of position so you have to be careful with it This notch here that the lever sits inside looks similar to the other notches, um, but the way you identify it is this small dot here, the, the hole there is the only small one. The rest of the holes are elongated slots. So that's how you identify it. And as you're looking at it this way, the hole sits on the left because this thing can go in backwards. Um, but I like to mark it. And to remove the ring, you got to kind of pry it out because it's seized up in there. Now, after this is removed, sometimes you can just wiggle these and get them free. Uh, this one, this one moves nicely, but not through its entire range of motion. This one won't move at all. That one won't move at all. There are some bolts here and you can take those bolts out. I haven't had a big problem with these breaking but I almost always use an impact driver to get them out. Um, but if they break you're in a world of hurt. This is an impact driver. Um, it's a device for taking out screws that are uh, tight. get this out some gentle prying right here it has to be done evenly and very gently you don't want to damage the area inside there where you're prying you can see down inside there where the veins were sitting those parts shaped like an airplane wing there are the veins you can see the uh, shape where the carbon has built up around them which jams them and makes them stick stuck. Here's the vein assembly after cleaning it up real good with a wire wheel. Okay, to assemble the vein assembly, you point all the veins inwards, and that means the levers would be pointing outwards. And then I like to put a drop of um, anti-seize on each of the bolts, which I've already done. And then these spacers have a wide groove. The ones on top have a narrow groove that fits the ring. And I like to put a dab of uh, anti-seize on there to where it kind of glues them in place. And then 
that's ready to sit in the exhaust housing. <clears throat> and there's three holes on this assembly for uh, the, the pins that the spacers ride on. And then there's one hole that uh, is there for a pin that's a lever stop. I'll show you that in another segment, but right now I'm going to sit this down in there. But the pin for the lever stop goes towards this bolt here. That right there is the pin that stops the lever. Right there. Okay, got it all reinstalled. You want to wiggle these, make sure they all move good. If they don't move good, disassemble it. Sand on the veins a little bit, maybe sand on the surface they ride against. You also don't want to over torque the bolts. If you over torque them, they will uh, uh, jam up the veins. Uh, I'd like to give you a torque spec, but I don't think there's one published, so you just have to uh, do what you think is best on that one. Okay, our paint mark goes this direction on the turbo. After you drop the ring in, make sure it moves easily like this. And then you sit your spacers where they go. And lift up the ring to where the groove in the edge of the spacer, to where this groove in the edge of the spacer rides on the ring. And you put your pin in. And again, verify that your ring moves easily. Now it's very important when you sit the cartridge down into the exhaust housing that this lever goes into that space and this pin goes into that hole. After you get this down far enough you can feel when that's inside the groove where it belongs. A little bit of gentle tapping and verify the ring still moves. And then bolt it down. And after you get it reassembled, you want to verify that it uh, moves correctly. And so I'm pumping it up with a hand pump. And you see there it moves all the way to the stop. Moves all the way back. That should give us good working boost. No over boost and no trouble code. Okay, I've road tested the car and uh, took a graph of boost control and it's much better. Uh, you see the green line comes up here and there's a slight downward swing in the green line. I don't know whether I backed out of the throttle or uh, some other road uh, conditions made it necessary to drop boost a little bit and then it comes back up to the straight line there. But uh, boost comes up out of control for just a brief moment then the computer is able to bring it under control and basically at that point it, it follows the, the green line. It is over the green line but a little bit isn't going to cause any problem. Uh, that's, it is normal for them to do that. and. Uh, 
I think this is good boost control that isn't going to trigger a trouble code. Now in comparison, we have our previous graph here whereas the boost just comes out of control and the whole time I'm flo on the floor it's completely out of control completely over the green line and it doesn't dro boost doesn't drop until I back out of the throttle which I think based on the graph we have a fixed car uh, obviously removing the turbo and disassembling it isn't cheap but it's definitely cheaper than a new turbo uh, you guys seen in the video that that turbo those turbo veins were completely seized up and um, a lot of shops would recommend replacing the turbo based on that and that may be uh, an option because this car certainly has a lot of miles these cars are getting older and they have a lot of miles on them all the time but uh, the turbo works fantastic um, I didn't show it in the video but I did wiggle the shaft and and check for shaft play and the shaft play was perfect uh, based on the conversation with the customer this turbo doesn't use oil I, I should say this engine doesn't use oil and so I think it's a good candidate for repair and obviously it's working good I took it out on the highway the limp mode didn't reoccur and uh, I think it's a good fix if you want to see more of these videos if you found any technical information in it that was worthwhile then click that like button and subscribe uh, and visit my website at www.kansascitytdi.com